Welcome to the Sweet Science of Fighting podcast. Today, we've got Gary Turner. Welcome, Gary. Thanks for coming on. Oh, no, thank you for asking me. It's a pleasure to be here. All right. So I've read some of your Wikipedia page. If anyone's interested, you can yeah. search Gary Turner Fighter on Wikipedia. You've got a, a big fight. I mean, what you sent me is what you do a bit of everything. Like, I'll probably, I mean, most people will call, say, a jack of all trades, master of none, but you're like a jack of all trades, master of all of them considering how much you've got with your fight back on what else you do. So why don't you just give us a little background of maybe a little bit about your fight career and then maybe how yeah. you transitioned into what you're doing now um, within your PhD. Yeah, sure thing. Um, well, I started with judo back in 1976 when I was six years old, started competing in 1978, and then sort of my martial arts and my martial, my combat sports career took off. Um, so I've got career highlights of being a world champion 13 times across kickboxing, Thai boxing and sports jiu-jitsu. I've been in the British schools judo team. I was UK K1 champion and fought on the official K1 circuit. Uh, good old Ray Seffo over in uh, New Zealand. Oh, yes. I so wanted to fight him, but didn't get the chance. Um, <laughs> you have to join the PFL was, now that he's hitting Yeah, there. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so randomly, I was also a British Wushu Kwan champion, uh, Chinese kickboxing. Um, I was also an international shoot fighter back in 1992. I won the Golden Dragon Cup in Rimini. Uh, and then I was at the very inception and development of mixed martial arts. Um, competed there, ended up fighting on the Cage Rage series. Uh, and I've, people I've fought, uh, boxers you may have heard of, uh, Alexander Rustinov, uh, Julius Francis, um, mixed martial arts, obviously Tank Abbott, uh, good old big tank, he's a legend. <laughs> um, kickboxing, I've fought people like Rick Rufus. Um, so I've, I've kind of been around the block a little bit. And that's just my career highlights for, for it. We've estimated that I've had over a thousand competitive bouts. Wow. Um, so my, my head's basically mashed. Um, <laughs> I've built a career. I mean, sport rewards, as my professor says, sport rewards genetic freaks. And I'm a complete genetic freak. I'm only six foot. Uh, I spent most of my fighting career sort of uh, early 90 kilos, sort of 91 to 93 kilos, fighting people up to 128, 143 with Julius Francis kilos. You know, uh, Alexander Rustinov and Bjorn Bregi, I think they're between six foot eight and six foot ten. I just used to go out there and fight. Uh, oh, I've also fought a high level karate as well. Uh, <laughs> I was asked to do the 10K karate challenge. Um, as a token K1 fighter, I, I've not done karate, uh, but uh, I'm going to give this a go. And I, I fought a guy called, I think it's Paul Newby. He uh, was a lighter weight than me, but this is karate, so it's points. And he was the world bronze medalist, and he beat me 3-2. I was like, gutted. <laughs> but you know, basically, back in, back in the day when I were young, we would just get asked to do things. We'd go out and do it. You know, it's, it's, it's fun. Um, we'd, we'd pick up flights. Like, um, I opened for Arnold Schwarzenegger. Um, I beat uh, for the Arnold Classic. Um, for a week's notice, Gary, we need you to fly out to uh, Ohio for the Arnold Classic to fight Carter Williams, the USA K1 champion. Uh, when, can, can you fly Wednesday? But it's only Monday. <laughs> yeah, of course I can. I wish you'd like, zip off and do it. You know, we, we, we fight. There's nothing protected. Um, we'll just go out there and fight anybody. So my fight career is basically uh, I'm tough <laughs> and I'm determined. Um, and I would just do what was necessary. So jack of all trades and, and master of a few. I'd actually say I'm a master of, of very few skills. So I've uh, always fought with applied psychology and whatever the combat sport rules that you're fighting under, applied psychology is always going to give you their heads up. But also I, I do things that people don't expect. So one of my coaches said, Gary, you just do things that you can't actually do. And then a friend corrected <laughs> him and said, nah, what Gary does is he makes things work that shouldn't. <laughs> and that's basically it. So I carried on fighting and then uh, 2009, uh, I had a tooth implant uh, and I was 39 at the time. Um, and I had, a, I had a little bone graft and then the tooth went in. I was like nine months away from fighting and at 39, I just wasn't getting the contracts that I was getting before. So I kind of like retired by default. Um, and then being a, a typical crazy idiot fighter, uh, <laughs> after that, I just went off and started running to keep in shape. And I've got a couple of Huskies. 
um, because I need something to get me up in the morning and, and get <laughs> yeah. me exercising and ended up doing ultra marathons. <laughs> so I did oh my eight, gosh. eight years, eight, nine years worth of ultra marathons. Um, and now I just train and do what I need to do just to, just to be fit and alive. So that's, that's my sport background. <laughs> so you, you've essentially gone from one extreme to another extreme and now you've kind of found the yeah. middle. <laughs> well, interestingly, I know we're going to blend into the scholarly work, um, but part of um, some, I've got this multidisciplinary PhD I'm doing, um, but the combat sports, for example, so mental toughness, resilience, uh, pain thresholds and such like, uh, combat sports athletes sit top of the tree out of all sports for those attributes. Mm. Uh, first off, uh, combat sports attracts people who are naturally like that but then it develops it and keeps it going as well if you haven't got it there's an attrition you'll drop out of the, the combat sport so we so combat sports are the, the, the toughest of all and then beneath it we've got combat sport uh contact sports yeah. rugby afl and such like um, and then beneath that you've got more normal sports interestingly the only people who come close to the resilience pain threshold and mental toughness ultra marathoners <laughs> <laughs> so 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 nine ten years after started doing ultra marathons i now know that for me it was actually a natural transition <laughs> yeah <fair enough. laughs> it's funny because you mentioned the the pain threshold and resilience my wife she was a six times karate world champion back in her day right. no, she, she also kicked my butt <laughs> yeah she competed in the crossfit games she's a medalist in olympic weightlifting at the commonwealth games and it's funny because I always tell her she has the highest pain threshold out of like anyone I know. And yeah. she's so resilient. I mean, she's done like four or five Commonwealth games that took her, I think four Commonwealth games that she win the medal. Nice. Like that's like 16 years of resilience, you know? So it's yeah. funny how you mention yeah. those things and it kind of like ties up really well there. But I want to go further into your, into your PhD as well. Because yeah. you're, you're studying, you say it's multidisciplinary, but we'll, yeah. I mean, you, I know you're, you're studying like head trauma as well. What, was there something that happened within say your fight career that got you down that road was it something or was it just something you just fell into it, it was something i fell into <clears throat> it was one of these chance meetings with with, with extraordinary people so I, I got tagged on an online forum a sports forum <laughs> um, by a friend of mine who i used to teach judo to back when he was younger and he, he was doing his degree and this professor on the forum had said that in the uk hitting kids in the head in combat sports is child abuse. So I got called in, I get known as the credible Hulk, not the incredible <laughs> Hulk, but the credible Hulk, because I don't speak unless I can back it up, unless I've got the evidence to back it up. And I allow my opinion to change as new evidence comes out. Uh, or I'm corrected. You know, I, I, I prize being right far too great to hold on to things that are wrong. So something is new and that, that makes sense. Oh, is yet. I better change my opinion. Yeah. Uh, but I, I got called on there to, to counter his views because I love my combat sports. So I went online and I found his Professor Anderson, Eric Anderson, my, my professor, um, and I found him incredibly engaging. And he could talk to me on a highly technical level that I needed to understand the ins and outs of it far better because this whole social, cultural, medico legal um, uh, sort of environment that's it. And he could talk to me on the level that I, I needed. But at the same time, so he could put things damn bluntly for those who needed to put damn blunt. So I went away and I, I gave myself uh, two weeks to prove him wrong. Came back two weeks later and I basically had to tell everyone that not only is he right with what he's saying, he's actually understating the situation. He's very conservative with his views here. He's putting it gently to us. Um, basically in the UK, under CPSU guidance, the Child Protection and Sport Unit, um, and all child safety welfare, it's actually illegal to hit a child in the head. Even if a child hits another child in sport, it's not been granted legal exception. It's mm. not tested and it will be coming through. But I, I, I can't deny data. So yeah, we, you know, basically it was child abuse and the damage <laughs> is quite, quite intense. So I started studying and Eric would send me the odd message and I'd say, have you seen this Gary? What do you think of this? Um, and at the time, um, so 2016, he and others in my scholarly team, or who became part of the, who were in the scholarly team that I've become part of, let's get it right. Yeah. But if I say my scholarly team, <laughs> I'm, the new, I'm the new kid on the block, yeah? 
but they were the ones who were challenging whether it was right to allow tackle rugby in schools. Different to the community setting, when you've got rugby trained coaches training kids how to play it properly, tackle properly and the rest of it. Um, and it kicked off in the media and such like. Mm, I um, remember. Yeah, it was, it, was, it was a lot of fun um, because I saw what happens when data meets passion and how sport looks to protect itself all the way through. Um, so I had this, all these discussions taking place and I was reading books, I was devouring books. And then Eric started saying, you ever thought about doing a PhD? <laughs> <laughs> He started dropping the seeds in. And, and in the end, he basically said, come on, Gary, you got to do it. You know you want to. You've got the time. You've got the space. You've got the availability. you got to do it. So I'm like, yeah, but I, you know, I got my degree back in 96 in building surveying, you know, architecture and stuff. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm, I'm, I'm cut out to go back to the scholarly world. Uh, so he said, come and sit in on my lectures. I'm teaching sociology of sport the next, the next semester. So I, I sat in on three months three hours every Friday morning of sociology and sport. I loved it so much that I didn't know that I needed to know. It, it, <laughs> it, was, it was brilliant. And yeah, we, we, we carried on chatting. Uh, and yeah, I'm now doing this multidisciplinary PhD into the behavioral effects uh, of repetitive head impacts in combat sport athletes. Um, and to say it covers a lot is an understatement. <laughs> mm. I can <laughs> it, imagine. It's, it's, yeah and it's it's quite interesting because it's not just um it's not just the knowledge it's not just the, the research that we're doing we're looking to make it usable as well and we're looking to help improve people's lives uh quite often people say oh gary you just want to ban the sports and i'm like i'm trying <laughs> to save the sports um i'm trying to save you and the sports um because we all know what happens. You know, most of you have seen Will Smith's film, Concussion, where he plays the real life person, Bennett Amalu, uh, who found chronic traumatic encephalopathy, um, CTE in an American football player. Uh, and it results in one heck of a lot of kickback from the sport. Uh, and basically quite, a, I think it's something like over, over 4,000 now out of court settlements, mm. multi-million figures for <clears> almost each one uh, for, for players. Um, and it, it's kicking off in rugby at the moment. Um, I was privileged to chat with Alex Popham, an international rugby player who kind of like heads up the players. And I've been chatting all through the first lockdown in the UK in 2020. I chat with his lawyer as well about it, the legalities of it and the duty of care. Uh, as an Australian scholar, Thorpe, a legal scholar, he, he makes it quite blunt uh, that you haven't got all these levels of protection in place by the year 2012. If you've not mm. got them, you're now failing in your duty of care and you're open to litigation. Mm. Combat sports are low hanging fruit. I mean, we're dinosaurs. <laughs> you know what I mean? We, we still, some of the practices in combat sports are absolutely horrific. Um, and, and considering that, uh, so my, my, my latest thesis chapter is the epidemiology of traumatic brain injury in combat sport athletes. So epidemiology is, is how many traumatic brain injuries we get, how many of us actually receive that, and the combat sports I'm looking at, boxing, mixed martial arts, kickboxing and tie boxing, full contact, striking arts, we've got MMA, um, it's got the grappling in the mix. Um, but interestingly, boxing and MMA have just about the most head impacts out of everything. MMA just more than boxing, which mm. surprised me because you've got the yeah. grappling element. Because a lot of people say, you know, yeah, ah, so that's that's the reason then that MMA has that. Okay, okay. Yeah, we just get far more batteries on the ground than boxers do. We we actually get more hits to the head, um, and it's smaller mm. gloves as well. What what do you what do you boxes. say to the to the people that say that because of the training? So boxing training, you obviously only throwing punches to the head and body, whereas in MMA training, you have days maybe where you're just grappling. Does that make a difference, or is this just within the fights? It seems that we still get more okay. <laughs> impacts <laughs> <laughs> overall, uh, which is which is the really worrying part. Um, you know, we 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 literally we've got a sport, we've got sports here where we lead with our heads. Um, but if you take uh, boxing and MMA, MMA just slightly highest, and then boxing, and then kickboxing, 
uh, and then Thai boxing very slightly lower, maybe because of the, the grappling and things, but the elbows tend to create more acute injuries. So yeah. basically any full contact art where we strike to the heads, well, we'll give ourselves a good twatting in the heads, but uh, is not good for us. And it's its highest out of all combat sports um, and considerably so. So in this chapter, I looked at first off, how much is, what's the threshold that our brains have got uh, before we suffer traumatic brain injury? And it's minuscule. We're talking head in a football six times, just lobbed underarm, has enough force for using uh, testing to, to see the, side, the, the adverse effects of traumatic brain injury. Even fast cuts and turns on a football field, if they're done repeatedly, those head movements are violent enough to show the effects of it. And looking at the, uh, the biomechanics of, of, of traumatic brain injury, basically every single direct hit that we get causes traumatic brain injury. Uh, if we've got glancing blows or even light contact, they're likely to create brain damage which is the structural injuries and things that happen that will very quickly accumulate to injury, which is then dysfunction. So think of it this way. Every time we get hit, that's actually a traumatic brain injury event. We're damaging ourselves. Uh, and then it's also, so the individual events, but it also accumulates as one overall injury. It compounds over time, making it worse and worse. Um, so much so that the Professional Fighters Brain Health Study in Nevada, it studied a load of mixed martial artists and professional boxers at, at professional level. Um, and they're doing yearly um, brain scans, cognitive testing and such like. And even over the course of a year, brains are shrinking. Oh, wow. cognitive abilities shrinking even over the course of the year it's this longitudinal study so taking people and seeing what happens to them it's it's scary so basically we get an astronomical amount of traumatic brain injury events um each round of sparring we're getting on average between four and 18 hits to the head up to even 42 or more hits to the head each of which have enough force to create traumatic brain injury <laughs> and every single one of us gets traumatic brain injury uh, the only difference is how much the effects are on us as an individual yeah. and when those effects hit in it's 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 a scary proposition uh, yeah literally we're uh, yeah, we're not doing ourselves any favors, unfortunately. <laughs> man i've got i've got so many questions from that i'm going to try and remember them all but i'm going to go with this logically I guess moves next. So you talked about traumatic brain injury. What's the difference between a traumatic brain injury and a concussion? Are they the same thing? If I get a concussion, do I have traumatic brain injury? If I don't get a concussion or don't get knocked out, you've obviously mentioned that some movements cause traumatic brain injury anyway. So is, yeah. is getting knocked out, having a concussion, a worse traumatic brain injury than just a knock to the head or are they kind of on the same level? One just ends up being lights out. <laughs> Yeah, this gets, I've got some props. I'll, I'll explain what actually happens oh, yeah. in a moment. But with the traumatic brain injury and concussion, uh, they're not the same thing. So traumatic brain injury is the injury taking place. A concussion are particular, is particular signs and symptoms that are associated with and develop from a traumatic brain injury. But you can have traumatic brain injury without a concussion. And there's lots of other injury effects. Um, but so if I, if I see a paper that says concussion is a, a traumatic brain injury, I face palm because it's not the same thing. They're related, but they're not the same. Uh, so concussion of signs and symptoms, they don't tell you what the actual damage is. Mm. They don't tell you how it's being caused. They don't tell you the disease pathways. So someone, I can't remember the, the, the citation now, but they, they, they said, a, a traumatic brain injury is the most complex set of diseases, plural, in the most complicated organ in the human body. So it's not just one disease. So concussion is just a syndrome, a collection of behaviours that's come from a neurological event, which is traumatic brain injury. They're not the same thing. Uh, and concussion, there's no actual uh, agreed definition of what a concussion is that is uniform. There's six different consensus statements as to what a concussion is defined <laughs> as. Uh, and 
sports tends to use concussion as, oh, I've got a concussion. That doesn't sound so bad as, oh, I've got a traumatic brain injury. <laughs> it's almost like a euphemism, so eh? <laughs> Yeah, so it's a sport, sport kind of like a, a, as a, a creative concussion as like a, it's a, like a, a lesser term for traumatic yeah. brain injury. It's <laughs> less scary. Uh, you know, it's like a, if you say to people, oh, if you take up combat sports, you might get a concussion compared to you take up combat sports and you're going to get numerous traumatic brain injuries in fact an astronomical amount of them that will have an effect across your lifetime and you'll never recover from it that's the difference between using traumatic brain injury and concussion concussion is like one tiny area this whole spectrum of traumatic brain injuries perhaps perhaps it's easiest if i get my, my little props out yeah. and show you yeah go so, for it <laughs> um, um, when Will Smith, when he was researching Benet Amalu in his work for the film Concussion, Benet Amalu needed to describe to Will Smith and show him exactly what's going on in people's brains for Will Smith to get the idea. Um, I think they used like an avocado or something in a jar uh, in the film. Uh, but I've recreated what Benet Amalu did with uh, Will Smith. So what I've got in here is just like a, 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 a jar, it's a glass jar. Um, and then there's a water balloon, which can kind of like wobble around and move around a little bit um, to, to get rid of the friction. I've got a tiny little bit of fluid in there, like cerebrospinal fluid. And this represents a head. Yet this is only part of a head. There's a couple of important layers missing. So on the outside of the skull, we've got our skin. In fact, if you, if you Google Gary Turner Wikipedia, is it Gary the fighter or is it Gary stretchy skin man? I am not the stretchy skin Gary Turner Wikipedia. <laughs> yeah, Gary Turner fighter, thank you. But yeah, so we've got skin on the outside. So when we get hit, the skin, the scalp, the hair, that will actually dissipate some of the force. Beneath that, then we've got the skull. Yeah, the various parts of the bone structure that become fused together and the jaw that opens and closes and stays a little bit, little bit loose. Now, the purpose of that is actually to protect the brain. So when we get an impact, the purpose of the skull is to dissipate and spread a lot of the energy around the outside of the, of the brain so it doesn't get on the inside. And in fact, if the force is strong enough, we get like a, a, an indent. We get literally a skull fracture. So at the point of impact <clears throat> goes down and like sort of pressure ridges, they rise around the outside. We get the fracture around the outside of it. And the skull fracture actually saves the brain from taking a fair amount of trauma. So the skull's protective of the brain. So we've got skin around the outside, then we've got the brain. On the inside, we've got a set of tissues known as meninges. Uh, my, one of my supervisors, my PhD, Adam, he hates that word. So Adam, <laughs> meninges, yes, yeah, squirm. But yeah, we've got meninges, <laughs> all the different layers, yeah? Um, and um, that's where uh, and you've got various like vascularity going through sort of, sort of blood vessels that pass through from the skin to the brain. So that if we get something called a subdural hematoma, it's the blood vessels between the meninges and the brain which have perforated. And as they bleed out, it creates swelling that puts pressure on the brain. Uh, subdural hematoma, uh, the most common brain injury in boxers, that, in kickboxers, tie boxers, mixed martial artists that causes death. So we've got the um, skin, scalp, hair, etc. We've got the skull. Then we've got the meninges and the brain sits inside the meninges. The brain doesn't bounce off the skull itself. So when we hit, mm -hmm. we have something called linear movements. So if I hit boom, on the outside, see the brain move? Yep. Yeah. So the strain, the force, some of it goes around the outside of the skull and some of it gets straight, you know, goes into the brain, which then moves. So we've got stretch point at this end and then a compression point at this end and then it reverses and it bounces. We get that bouncing. Mm -hmm. That's linear motion. The brain moves about one millimeter plus or minus each way. It doesn't sound like a lot, but it's able to cause a lot of a damage like that. Also, at the same time, we get rotational movement where the brain will then rotate inside the meninges, inside the skull, inside the, 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 the skin, and such like. And that will move by plus or minus four or five millimeter. And that will develop a lot of strain down to the real center of the brain. So when we get hit, basically the skull, the, the, uh, the, the brain moves. We can't get away from that. Um, through normal life, we've got a system of getting a knock, 
repair repeat. It's just that we're not given a chance to repair and we're of a magnitude so much it doesn't get the opportunity to. Mm. I don't know whether this will come out. It, it did with the last one before the balloon burst, but I'll get my cushion. <laughs> That's my husky. So we go on my, my little seat cushion. Yeah. Harley and Max husky. Um, and I'll put that there and then hit it. Can you see that the brain actually moves? Yep. And if, if, if you do it in a lab for the same impact each time, You've got movement when you hit, but when you put a cushion against it, the brain actually moves more. Mm. So there's something called compliance. Compliance is the rate of force transfer between the strike hitting and it's how quickly that force transfers to the target. If it's a fast impact, a high compliance and the force from the punch goes straight through, then it tends to create acute injuries local to that point of impact. The brain still moves, but you're more likely to get acute, the uh, subdural hematomas and such like the vascularity. It's, it's like all that force gets concentrated in one area, but it saves the rest <clears> of the brain. <throat> but one area basically is screwed. <laughs> but sure. if you put padding in front of it, more of the force is a slower rate of force transfer and more of the force goes into the brain, creating a more spread out diffuse injury. So it's less concentrated and more spread out. So instead of a catastrophic small injury, we just basically mess the whole brain up instead. A catastrophic big injury instead. You got it. So <laughs> we're wearing headgear, for example, when we're sparring and such like, uh, we're actually increasing the brain injuries that we're getting it's quite it's quite it's quite worrying there's no you know it's there's no way around it you can't you can't literally you can't protect the brain uh, if we get hit it's going to cause you the damage we wear big gloves but the bigger gloves are oh, big gloves and headgear uh, that's what i used to do. i used to wear 18 20 ounce gloves uh, so i didn't hurt my training partners little did i know back then i was actually increasing the amount of force that's going to the brain oh um, yeah so that's the brain bouncing around um, a little hit we may not actually experience it and for that i've got a little tidy up to do after this after this podcast because <laughs> this always goes everywhere so what i've got here is a load of spaghetti right and imagine this spaghetti is a little bundle of spaghetti there a load of networks in the brain loads of connections in the brain yeah and if we get a little hit boom it gets a little bit of strain yeah mm -hmm. little hits little bits of strain now it doesn't actually snap with a little bit of strain, but what's happening is it's weakening. There's damage taking place. It's starting to weaken. So every time even those little light hits, it's weakening. Then over time, oh, now they're starting to snap and those connections are starting to go. Or if we get, say, the overhand right that Tank Abbott got me with, <laughs> it goes straight away, yeah? So the communication between these is, is, is damaged. But when these break, or indeed, as they start to perforate, as they twist, think of it like a big garden hose. I've got all the props. Garden yeah, I was going to say, yeah. where are you pulling these from? <laughs> no, you know, <laughs> at me bum, look, another one. You have to put a rabbit out of a hat. Uh, but it's like garden hose. Um, if you start putting too much strain in, it will start to perforate, and bits of the water that's on the inside will start pouring out into the brain or spitting out. And that's what's happening inside our brains with all the connective tissues. So there's uh, blood that comes out and all the metabolites in the uh, 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 the blood as the, the blood starts to, uh, the vessels start to tear and perforate. Uh, the same with our axons and dendrites, the connections between the neurons, it starts to um, um, perforate and all that muck spilling out. And when it's actually snapped, obviously we're generally screwed. So the first thing that happens is there's an immediate effect. There's an immediate effect on, the, on, on our behavior. So imagine that these three bits of spaghetti are bridges over a river. My finger's the river, mm -hmm. okay? And we wanna go from point A to point B, yeah? With the brain intact, it's quite straightforward. We just go over the first bridge, yeah? Now we get a light impact, like an earthquake, yeah? Mm -hmm. The bridges may remain, but what we're not seeing mm -hmm. is the weakened structures now as a result of that. Another oh, earthquake, aftershock, there we go. Bit of a Kiwi aftershock going on there. Yeah? <laughs> and the, 
there's maybe maybe there's a few like water mains now going on the inside, but we still can't see that. We still go from point A to point B, but then catastrophic one and the bridge breaks. Now we can't go from point A to point B directly. What we can do is reroute and we go down to the next bridge along and up. So think of a, a, a boxer and suddenly the legs go. That's this happening, mm. but then they regain the legs. The brain is literally using more connections and it's going to the next bridge, going along and going up. So it regains function, but it's got to go further. It's a little bit mm -hmm. slower. Everything starts to slow from the brain's operation through to a result and action. Every hit actually slows the way that we respond. Another earthquake, bang, next one go. Hey, it's okay, we'll reroute. Now we'll go to the bottom one, go along and go up, uh, which is now even longer still, or even slower at responding. Um, think about sparring. This is what's happening in sparring. You think you're improving your fight ability when sparring, you're actually taking three steps forward and then two to four steps back every time you get hit. And then eventually we run out of bridges. Now we can't get across the bridge from point A to point B and we've lost that function. So in the immediate uh, and the acute time, so the minutes to hours afterwards, we've got the effects of the primary injury, the basic structures going wrong. But then we've got the secondary injury, which is known as the neurometabolic cascade, uh, which gets really, really complicated when we go into. So I prefer to describe it as a battle of good versus evil. <laughs> so that neurometabolic cascade, we've got all these broken connections and everything pouring out of it. It's all going into the brain. It's like, no, it's messing us up. We get these really excitable neurons that start going, yeah, yeah, start jumping up and down. And then they use too much energy. So they die, like explode, you know, like a, like, <laughs> like if you've got like a, a five-year-old at Christmas, they're always like explode, Christmas. That's what your brain cells are like, but they pop, you know, that, that actually pop, but things are <laughs> popping. And then you get some, and so you're taking all my energy. I'm like, <clears throat> I'm dying. They can't operate, yeah? So you've got neurons like getting excited and dying or, or being starved of energy and dying. So at the same time, you've got this reparative, adaptive processes taking place, doing its best to repair everything, <clears throat> to reroute, to get rid of all the crap that's been spilling out into the brains. Yet, it never actually clears everything up. So for example, if that was a, 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 an axon, a, a connection between two brain cells and it's snapped or it's perforated, things like phosphoryl phosphorylated tau protein, good old tau protein and something called beta amyloid start basically spewing out into the brain. Now they accumulate in sort of the crevices of the brain at the bottom and they start creating adverse functioning, uh, brain atrophy, brain death at the bottom. Um, that's CTE. That's what happens with CTE. CTE is related to, but not quite the same as Alzheimer's. So with CTE, the tau proteins accumulate in the bottom of the crevices, but with Alzheimer's, they're generally on the top surfaces. Mm. Slight, slightly different nuance, but they are related. So then what happens is we've got this reparatory process taking place and we've got this like death and destruction taking place. There's this is battle going on. And that's why sometimes we feel sleepy because our brain's shutting mm. down. Like, come on, man, give me a chance. Give me a chance. And that's why for the first 24 to 48 hours after receiving a hit to the head, if you have rest, i.e. nothing cognitive, looking at screens, listening and watching podcasts and such like <laughs> no TV, no screens, you know, turn your little, phones off and stuff, your smartphones, uh, and don't do the physical activity. It gives your brain a chance to do what it needs to do, that adaptive process. Um, and then you need a gradual return to play as we go. So the secondary injury, that's when we will generally get the signs and symptoms of concussion. When we get, oh, oh it's a bit bright, aversion to light. Oh, shh bit sharp on the ears, the aversion to sound, photophobia and phonophobia. Uh, we'll get the headaches. Uh, we might get the sickness and nausea. We might just feel drowsy. Yeah, that's when we get those kind of symptoms. But concussion is just a, 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 just a set of small sy symptoms and signs. Signs are things you can see. Symptoms are, are experienced by the person. For example, I can't see if you've got a headache. 
yeah that would be a symptom you subjectively experience it and you've got to voice it to me you've got a headache your legs go that's a sign i can now mm. see that signs and symptoms not the same thing so in the acute and the subacute so we've got the injury and straight away our ability to think act and behave changes straight away we're literally slower at responding so every hit means you're more likely to get another hit and more likely to lose um, and then uh, we've got the, the situation where the secondary injury starts to unfold we start getting drowsiness we got start getting signs and symptoms even in the absence of those we're still cognitively our ability to learn our ability to retain information our memory all becomes depressed and then what then happens is over the chronic time so we're talking months to quite a few years we start developing mood disorders because the areas of the brain that we're damaging are associated with mood and emotion and such like so the classic things are more aggressive tendencies it's kind of like mm. um whereas before so we, we lose impulse control for example it's like driving your car yeah it's like well, yeah, we're driving great time to stop oh damn it we can't because we've gone over a rock and it's kind of a brake line that's what our, 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 our sort of aggression's like it's like hey what are you doing <laughs> And then normally we'd stop because we're kind of a bit reserved. I said, what are you doing? And now we <laughs> we, we can't stop. The brakes are off. Yeah. That, that reminds getting... me of those old, old news stories. I think it was like old WWE wrestler or something that ended up killing his whole family and, yeah. and committing suicide. Yeah. And they put it on CTE or something, or some kind of brain brain problem. Yeah. Now we're, we're, we're a lot in, in combat sports. Uh, one of the things that we've actually got is self-control, as it turns out. Um, we're actually less aggressive than other contact sports, which is just the nature of the fact we're aggressive in our day jobs. It's like we don't want to take our work home, do we? Um, <laughs> it's like, these are the tools of our job. It's like if you're IT, you wouldn't get your laptop and lob it over your shoulder. We look after our bodies because, you know, we, you know what, you want to fight? No, 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 I get paid millions for that, thanks. Well, I wish I did. <laughs> but does that, does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. We're less likely to actually engage in those behaviours. But we do suffer things like, um, so combat sports, just the nature of the impacts, we suffer more memory issues, which affects everything that we do. Um, and it will also get more motor control issues, which is why uh, Parkinsonism uh, is part of the, part of the issue. Um, you know, we get mood disorders that then take place in the, sort of the, over a period of years, but we also get the earlier onset and more rapid development of neurodegenerative diseases. For those, we're talking Alzheimer's disease, various dementias, Parkinsonism, uh, amylateral sclerosis, ALS, the old ice bucket challenge stuff, the multiple sclerosis and such like of the, uh, of the neurodegeneration world, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, uh, CTE. Um, that's only one tiny part of these neurodegenerative diseases that take place. Everyone goes on about CTE and I'm like, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. Why, why are you just talking about CTE? What about dementia, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's mm. and such like? The motor neuron diseases. It's, it's all caught in the mix. Basically getting hit in the head. We never fully recover from being hit in the head housekeeping at night can only do so much the little cells that run around with a little brooms and sweeps and all oh, dustpan and brush get rid of that there's only so much of that that we can that we can actually repair <laughs> normal human day-to-day -day life the little things we do is knock our heads on the wall that kind of thing that's what that's designed for it's not designed for getting between eight and 48 hits per round of sparring <laughs> every week <laughs> every week yeah. it is not designed <clears throat> although a lesser um, so headers, those six headers of a football uh, lobbed underarm, they're creating brain accelerations of around 8.6 through to around 15 G. Uh, a right hook, we're talking about 80 to 90 G. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and then, which is the force of basically two American footballers with all their size and weight, full pelt, running at speed and colliding it's like being hit on the head by a vehicle a medium-sized car going at 30 to 40 mile an hour that's what a right hook is doing but then if you want to take it up a level a mm. round kick we can double that wow so if you're thinking six headers of a football 
is all that's required are those tiny little head movements is all that's required for testing to show the brain damage and the traumatic brain injury that's unfolding enough to affect someone's behavior imagine what we're doing to ourselves it's like it's like crazy so with my with my research for example we're actually looking at performance deficits through getting hit in the head mm. Because we're thinking, how do, how do we get through to, to fighters? I mean, you know, we're, we're thick as two short planks anyway. I mean, we, we, we're making a living and doing a sport where we hit each other in the head. You know, whoever thought that was a good idea, you know? It's damn good fun though, isn't it? But here's a <laughs> thought, right? If we limit what we do to competition, then we're reducing the hits that we have to the head. And then people say, well, what about training? And then you think, well, why do we spar? We spar to get the appropriate response to stimuli in competition. You don't need to spar to do that. You can create, um, so for strength, for example, you want to improve strength, do mental rehearsal, mental training. Strength is motor neuron, you know, the main part of it is how much motor neuron, uh, uh, how much uh, motor units you can recruit in your muscles. It's neurological. So that's why you've got the five by fives with five minute break in between. We're training those muscles to maximally lift. We're trying to get all that recruitment and then firing and wiring, let it wire in the background. Mentally, mental rehearsal, you can actually increase your strength. You can increase technique. Who in combat sports, apart from me, because I'm a hypnotist, does mental <laughs> rehearsal and trains their people with mental rehearsal? Um, it's a massive part. If, an, if, if, if a combat sport athlete is not doing appropriate mental training and mental rehearsal, they're never going to hit their full potential. So imagine what the good ones who aren't doing it are going to be like when they do. Yet then, sparring is, if we get hit in the head, it's, it's, it's slowing our ability to respond and act we're more likely to get injuries of any kind as a result because we're literally lowering the control of our bodies. So who thinks it's a good idea to get hit in the head in training, lowering our ability to respond and <clears throat> act? How's that a good idea for competition? So it's time to start thinking about new ways of training. Uh, my guys, I, I, I play around a lot with slow motion training. Mm -hmm. uh, and I find it highly successful for many reasons. I would do various protocols of it, but basically what you're doing is now stimuli, they're starting to throw a shot. You start to see every first movement, reading how that shot's moving, how it's going. You're now thinking, what's the appropriate move in this context? And then you're executing it, yet with control, because it's slow motion. We do various speeds of, you know, one person might be going full speed, but not non-contact the other person going super slow and we can start doing sort of various mids and matches on it we're having a great success with that so we're getting the appropriate response to stimuli but without being hit in the head oh how much better is that so my aim for combat sports stop hitting kids in the head <laughs> because under under 18 is a, the, the legal definition of a child and in the uk at least uh, the um every piece of child uh, welfare legislation says you can't do that and the criminal legal position is that no child can consent to harm we now know that getting hit in the head causes harm and no adult can consent on their behalf mm. so we can't use the excuse of but he likes to do it i'll let him do it we can't <laughs> use that anymore yeah and the case law for that was actually tattoos where mm. some kids went and got tattoos uh, and the parents sued the tattooist <laughs> and that's where the, that's where it starts coming on uh, but you know it's it's so i want informed consent i want fighters i want combat sport athletes to understand what we're doing when we're twatting each other in the head so if we know what we're doing and actually we're fully informed then we get the opportunity to make an informed decision to to, to practice also we then get the ability to think about what we're doing and find safer ways of doing it yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, we don't, you know, back in my days, oh, I remember fought Matt Skelton. Um, and oh, my brain was shot. I was slurred speech. I blew my nose. I had a little mini fracture. My eye socket mm. blew up. And oh, man, my eyes were pointing in opposite directions. I was like <laughs> that crazy guy from Happy Gilmore. Was it Happy Gilmore? Yeah. Like, His eyes, I was like that. Uh, yeah. I, I, was, I was out of it. Two days later, I'm sparring again. Yeah, crazy, eh? <laughs> 
in knowing what I know now, yeah, because I'm actually at risk of death at that point in time. Because mm. if you don't let your brain recover to the best of its ability, that damage can actually shut down parts of your brain, can shut down your life support system. It's something called second impact syndrome. Uh, it's, I, I think the research states that yes, it does happen in adults, um, but some research states that it doesn't only happens in kids and developing, developing kids. Um, there's a classic rugby case with a, a poor lad, Ben, who, who, who received a concussion on a rugby pitch. Um, they allowed him to play on. He had another oh. hit. And unfortunately, it was enough to, 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 to finish. It's horrific. Um, you know, the, the, the lack of duty of care, even at that time, with what we knew back then, was, was, was horrific. Um, and, and I hate I hate mentioning it because it makes me sad because it could have been prevented. Yeah. So it, you know, this is what we do. We put ourselves at risk. So I want informed consent. I want no head contact for under 18s. He will say, but then they won't be able to compete as an adult. It's like, look at the literature. Actually, <laughs> they will be able to within one year of having head contact. They'll be the same as someone who's had head contact their entire life, but they won't have the sort of 10, 12, 14 years of getting repetitive injuries. Uh, and I also want to make the whole practices, the whole uh, Medicare and such like far better. I want appropriate medical attention that shows. I want correct protocols in place and such like. Um, yeah, I just want to make it safer while preserving it. That's the, that's yeah. the important thing. So that's a lot of information for you. Yeah, there. I've got like a billion questions. So I'm going to try and remember them all and kind of run back. But your idea of that slow motion sparring as well. I love, I love that idea. One of my strength conditioning mentors, Vern Gambetta, always talks about rhythm, right? Sport is rhythm. And he'll get his guys in warm up. So whatever warm up drills are doing, he'll give them a rhythm. Like you have to do this, like it's a slow motion movie, or you have to do it backwards, like you would do it forwards and things like that. And as you mentioned, yeah. one person going slow, one person going fast or switching up, you're playing with the rhythm of essentially the sport. And if you can play different rhythms, break rhythms, etc., it's going to give you a huge advantage. I mean, you see, I think it's CSA gym, MMA gym. They're very against, I guess, hard sparring all the time. They, they often do very light sparring. There's some really good videos on YouTube of people doing like flow sparring and stuff like that. You, you yeah. get the same stimulus, just, yeah, without the head contact. But yeah. I, I mean, I'm going to jump into one of my millions of questions. One of them, you mentioned how, I guess, like the bridges, right? You snap the bridges. For example, you yeah. watch someone, if anyone watched the fight over the weekend, that was, that was scary stuff with... Yeah. Uh, yeah getting hit out of the ring Probably, and he was yeah. out for how yeah he was gone hmm. so you mentioned so he got dropped first uh, i think the round before so i guess you could say that's that's a couple of the bridges gone and then finally that last bridge gone you got are those bridge are those bridges then say within the fight but then is it fight to fight as well those bridges are gone forever they're gone so that so the next fight then you're, you're starting at a deficit again and the next fight you're yeah. a deficit again. so it's a, it's a gross generalization mm -hmm. and we, we know you know it used to be said that once you lose the brain cells you've lost them but we do know that new drain there is neurogenesis in the human brain we do get new brain cells but it's actually incredibly limited and there's only so much repair that can go on so whereas we may recover a little we're talking like a, a little knock on the head yeah, maybe head the football once a week. This is just a, a, a gross generalization. We'll probably repair from that quite nicely. Yeah. yeah, it's part of the normal, you know, it won't affect us adversely. We won't notice it. It won't, you know, we, we'll, we'll, we'll live it longer. So we're all basically going to wear out <laughs> soon. Uh, I've got an artificial hip at the moment. I was kicking eight, uh, kicking head. I was in body pump classes eight days after total hip replacement. I was kicking head height again six weeks later, clear to fire and do everything again and run again after 12. So it doesn't slow you back doesn't slow you at all but we're, we're going to run out we're, there's only so much replacing that we can do so normal life knocks that we get will generally not affect us we're just stacking the odds against us so with conlon he, he was it was conlon wasn't it yeah yeah so you know he's he, his spaghetti you know it was like a, a an italian chef having a right wobbling and ah uh, throw a pass around snapping it everywhere you know he's yeah. um he, he that's what his brain's like. When I saw the video the next day, he was going, yeah, I'm okay. And his face is all bent and broken. And you can see the damage, the amount of hits he's had um, and the impact, the soft tissue damage, the hemorrhaging on the, on, on the outside of the face. Uh, to receive that many hits that created that much soft tissue damage on the outside, God knows the, the bruising. Inside. 
the damage, the, the, the hematomas, the, 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 the connections that are gone, how much gunk has sort of pissed out of the broken and perforated connections. You know, he's, he's not done himself any favours in his career. And mm. I, I had a discussion online, actually, because I've got this thing that, and, and it, it's, it's coming out of the literature, and I'm not alone for saying this, um, people within the sport of boxing saying it as well, that we should stop a fight at the first signs of concussion. I was going to ask you that, if that's something you would change, because you see people get dropped, and you go, this, 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 I mean, people love the comeback story, right? The guy was almost out, and then he wins by knockout. It happens every now and then, but you watch the guys, and they go, this guy can barely stand. But because yeah, he's standing yeah. and, you know... <laughs> so, you, so there was a, a study of 30 so the professional fighters brain health study they looked at 30 ufc fights and 30 professional boxing matches in nevada um, and they had a look to see through video review when the first signs of concussion happened and i think one poor side had 12 concussions in one fight oh my lord because you recover, but it's just that rerouting taking place. Mm. And then he's gone again. It's like, heck, those bridges are gone now. You know, poor sod. Uh, but basically, the first person to show any signs of concussion invariably goes on to lose. Yeah. The one who gets more concussion events goes on to lose. So even there, they're suggesting the first sign of concussion stop the fight. But the problem is, and this, this is uh, one of my supervisors, John Batten, came back with and said, uh, what makes a classic fight? Yeah. Because a classic study looking at the number of hits <clears> for classic <throat> fights compared to, to, to ones that have caused death. And there's no difference in the number of hits. And, and it's like, you know, what makes a classic fight? What does everyone love about the classic fight? And it comes down to the sporting culture. We love the underdog. We love the war. Yeah. We love the battle. You the know, fight back. And, yeah. So, so I posted um, to, to, to high level, you know, these guys are, are boxing sort of pundits and journalists and boxers themselves and trainers and coaches. When was the first signs of concussion in that fight? And they said, well, simple round one. So then I said, <laughs> if I had my way and stopped it <laughs> at that first sign of concussion, that would ruin a classic fight, wouldn't it? And they're like, yep. Mm. And probably kill the sport too at it because no I'm one's going to yeah. tune in to watch so, it, you know? <laughs> yeah. So it's like you, you kind of stuck against it, but then everyone says, oh, it's a tragedy when a boxer dies. And I'm like, no, it's by design. <laughs> <laughs> Essentially a fight to the death. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. You know, it's just like, so, you know, the, the days of fighting to the death and gladiator times have now passed. You know, where do we draw a line to protect the, the individual? And then you've got some referees letting fights go on and other referees stopping fights early. So I think for, uh, and I've got a paper that I'm submitting at the moment on a fair and objective way of uh, uh, referee stoppage, which is at the first sign of concussion, because at least then it's uniform and everyone knows what they're playing to. It also might make it more interactive and it might make defensive be defenses better. Mm. So it might actually make it more, um, more the way that boxing was portrayed legally yeah. in the UK so that it wouldn't get uh, deemed illegal, which is a, it's a sporting endeavour and it's as much about the defence as it is about the offence. And it might put it back towards the offence. Unlike me, it took 10 to give 11. You know what I mean? <laughs> I didn't have a good career like that. Um, I, I led with my face. <laughs> uh, that's why I've got the good face for radio. This is an audio, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> What do you mean you're seeing me? Okay, Everyone, sorry, you must guys, watch it on YouTube. Your food. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so it's the case of, uh, we're, we're like, uh, you know, yeah, it's, do we ruin, how, how do we get the, the get it right for people? You know, there's this there's cries of like a, a box match a couple of weeks ago when a guy clearly won. He clearly won, but they awarded it against him. You know, it's a, we need some objectivity within the sport of boxing Otherwise, it's going to collapse anyway because there's so many wobblies being thrown everywhere. We need to uniform. It's like, no, this is how it is. This is what it is. No, your legs went, fight over. Yeah, that kind of thing. No, mm. you're fine. Carry on. And it's like a, a clear set of rules. I mean, referees don't even get trained in traumatic brain injury. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 it's horrendous. So, yeah, so it's like the classic fights, you know, we, we might end up with less classic fights and we would change the nature of it. And that's what happened with um, amateur boxing when they took the head guards away. For the first two years, injury rates went up and mm. then they dropped, especially concussions dropped because the sport changed. 
suddenly it became more professional head movement yeah. rather than more upright. Yeah. Yeah. So the, you know, it will change the nature of the sport, but at the same time, we're preserving health while keeping the sport before it gets deemed illegal. <laughs> nice. All right, I'm going to jump into some some practical things for the people listening yeah. as well. And I've got some other questions too that we can circle back to as well. I've, yeah, I've still got a bunch, but in terms of the practical side, so you mentioned about sparring as well. Something that people can do if, if they're in a striking sport to essentially lengthen their career. Would it be trying to minimize hard sparring then between fights and maybe only keep, I mean, it depends on the gym they're in too, right? They're going to, it's going to be dictated by where they train as well. So would it be then maybe hard sparring only once or twice, say, in the build-up to a fight, just so, I mean, people are going to do it anyway, to minimize well, was, that hit well, head damage? Well, I, I, I would change that because I, I wouldn't say any hard sparring. Yeah, no, no hard sparring at all? That's what you would recommend? To no, to I, I wouldn't have any yeah. head contact. Gotcha. And what about, um, what about headgear as well then? So then, because I know, I guess a lot of gyms will, will require headgear and large gloves yeah. for sparring, then you'd, you'd be like, okay, Best case scenario, ideal will. No hard, no hard sparring, no need for headgear. Yeah. No need well, headgear actually makes the brain injury worse anyway. Yeah. All headgear will do for a fighter, uh, for a benefit for a fighter, um, is uh, uh, maybe prevent some cuts and whatever. Yeah. Yeah, that's, exactly. that's about it with a, 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 you know, soft tissue injuries, that kind of thing. It's going to stop that, but it doesn't stop the brain injury at all. In fact, it makes the brain injury worse, allow more force to transfer to the brain. Mm. And then we've got risk homeostasis and risk compensation theories. I'm wearing it so we can go a little bit harder and it yeah. starts to escalate. Um, but it's, I, I would suggest that, that head impacts are not required in sparring to mm -hmm. perform at the highest level. You don't get hit to train to take a hit. Yeah. <laughs> get hit detracts from your ability to take a hit. Let the competition take care of itself. Ultramarathons, for example, uh, the, the world's best ultramarathoners don't run that far. Mm -hmm. They actually run to practice their technique and form. The races take care of the long stuff. The head contact, get rid of it from training. The competition delivers the head contact. Mm. So yeah, look to, look to lower it. Even back in the noughties, um, I spent three days in Amsterdam every two weeks. So um, I used to go out there, um, Lucian Carbin from Fighting Factory Carbin was my coach for a while. So I'd, I'd go out there and train with them. I'd like, hey, doggies. I love doggies as well. <laughs> Are you dogs in the I background? Just, yeah, I just mute the mic. <laughs> <laughs> dogs are cool, man. Um, life's not life without a dog. You know, it's a start each day with a wagging tail. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so Fighting Factory Carbin, for example. Um, so we're talking, uh, so I had Alistair Overeem, uh, Tyrone Spong, people like that. Um, um, as uh, my, my, my training partners, uh, Valentin Overeem is a beast as well. Uh, Thursday night, they've called it Black Hell. Uh, they call it Black Hell to me. It's a gym full of Surinamese and, 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 and um, they're all black, apart from me, the lone white guy, basically. <laughs> and there's an English guy there called Lonsdale uh, that was working in Amsterdam as well. There. But they called it, uh, so Rodney Glunda would call it um, uh, Black Hell. Um, <laughs> and it was, we do carousel sparring. So it'd be like me, Tyrone, Valentin, Alistair, uh, Remy Bonyaski would come over as well. Um, it's like this, you know, some legends there, plus me. And, and like like seven or eight people, one minute carousels going 100% flat out. And oh. it had to be 100% flat out to the body. Mm. Touch contact to the head, which then allowed for light contact with movement. So you aim for touch contact with the head, anything you like to the body. And that was, so even then back in the early noughties and mid noughties, uh, a fighting factory car in there watching how many hits to the head you're going to get. They realize it's not doing you any favors. Uh, went to uh, Cops Gym, uh, sorry, uh, Vos Gym, uh, and I was, uh, what was it, Cops? One or the other. I was training with Peter, Peter, Peter Arts, or Peter Arts. Um, I, I was training with him and had a, a, like five, six rounds with, with, with Pete. And I was doing all right. I got some lovely shots of me kicking his legs and stuff, and it's going really good. And then he let loose the thing he was working on, this right hand from hell. I saw it coming. The glove was just like getting bigger. And he was coming towards <laughs> me. We were like, oh my God. And he just stopped it on my head. And then we just carried on sparring. Wow. And we're having a drink afterwards. And I went, Pete, why, why didn't he let it go? And he, and he, and he went, well, he said, you know, you're a great sparring partner. You were enjoying it. I was enjoying it. Why injure? 
a sparring partner. You knew it hit. I knew it hit. We didn't need to actually hit it. So that was good. But then if you go to Mike's gym, they'll just kill each other. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that, that's awesome to hear. So if, if someone was going to spar, then that's how you'd recommend they should spar. If they were going to do yeah. 100% so, body, so, just touch contact to the head. You can still I get everything even go in. touch contact to the head. Yep. Yeah. I would, I'd, uh, with good coaching, check the form. Yeah, um, that's the thing too. You've got to have the coach on board. Yeah, yeah it's not... Where's my guard? <laughs> my head up here. You know, they, need, they need the coach to, to point out the technique. And of course, um, there's uh, um, the supplementary training, the mental rehearsal, slow motion stuff, the various drills and such like yeah. to get the right response to stimuli that sparring would provide. Uh, get that separate to the sparring and concentrate on body boxing. And Lucian, for example, was body box, body box, body box. It was great. Which was yeah. Body box city. That's how you, you get in there, glove up and start body boxing. And that was the start of the class. You know, as soon as your gloves are on, <laughs> away you go. Um, so I, I prefer to see that coming through more. Mm. No, that, that's a um, really good way to look at it too. That's a really, really good way. And I wanted to touch on as well, the idea of strength, strengthening the neck. So there's some, there's some pretty good research on, I guess, isometric neck training, reducing that peak linear acceleration of the head, like for example, hitting a soccer ball and stuff. Oh, heck, have you just seen the uh, study that was released in the BJSM a couple of weeks back? Might have no. done, hey? <laughs> I haven't. So, they're, they're saying the same thing. Yeah. Okay, so break it down for me. Is, is, is there essentially an intervention that can help us, for example, reduce the severity? Nothing? Can't nope. do anything? <laughs> nope. <laughs> so you've got you, there's a couple of ways of looking at it. Firstly, the research is um, a, a rugby scholar that I've got a friend with on Twitter. Um, she broke it down. It's her field. And she broke it down really well that um, neck strength on its own won't do anything. And she looks at it from the fact of the imbalance in the neck and how that sits amongst the rest of the framework, the structure, the uh, biotensegrity of, say, a rugby player on it. Mm -hmm. So that on its own won't help. Um, and you might be putting injuries to other places as well. But also, you have the strongest neck in the planet. Um, and if you don't apply it at the right time. <laughs> yeah. There's, yeah, there's also a rate of force development concept too, you know, how quickly you can turn that force on and pull that braking force on. You got it. But then if you think that this car is coming at 30 mile an hour to my head, okay? So if my neck isn't strong, my head might move that way more. Boom. So my head accelerates. So the force hits my head, creating the movement, and the force is still going through the brain. The old brain's giving it a wobble as it moves away. Or... I resist that force. So <laughs> the kinematics change. So the same force is being hit, but now my head's not moving and I'm mm. tense. Where's that strain gonna go? Straight through. Straight through to the brain. It becomes almost like a, a, a blast wave, a shock mm, wave traumatic yeah. brain injury that the military get. So you get this, you know, if you move with it, are you actually dissipating some of the force by the movement, if we're resisting it, going in, we might actually be allowing more to force to mm, go through the brain. Interesting. In other words, um, on the balance of uh, what the evidence shows at the moment, neck strengthening doesn't work. Even application of neck strength doesn't work. All it does is, again, change the nature of the injury. So interesting. MMA gloves nice and light four to six ounces depending on what rule set you've got acute mm. injury localized big 20 ounce boxing gloves yeah hits the head spreads it out more same well not same grade injury it's different it's the same extent of effect and damage just focused in different ways does that make sense yeah so yeah neck 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 strength um uh no unfortunately uh and what makes it worse is some of the press, and we, we, you know, we, we're not fans of the latest study that was in the British Journal of Sports Medicine yeah. for, for, for quite a few reasons. Um, and I've actually got a complaint here with the BJSM. <laughs> to the B, I, I, need to, I need to read that, actually. I still need to read that. Oh, it's well, cut a long story short. You've got the Concussion Sport Group, which was headed up by Paul McCrory, an Australian scientist. 
scientist <laughs> who was for seven years he was the editor of the british journal of sports medicine turns out he's been committing plagiarism in his articles oh nice he admitted to <laughs> one to start with uh, but by the time two days have passed, about two days, uh, there's a guy called Nick Brown. I thought, like, I think I'm going to have a look at his articles. Like, he'd found 10 that he'd plagiarised. Damn. And then an 11th one came up where, let's just say the data was very questionable. <laughs> so he's disgraced um, and he's uh, uh, attended his resignation, which was accepted from the Concussion and Sport Group. The Concussion and Sport Group has a huge <clears throat> corporate entanglement <clears throat> with <throat> World Rugby, the NFL, the International Olympic Committee and such oh, like. Okay. And we've always been complaining. Uh, and there's a, a, a paper, Casper, uh, and Alan Pierce and lots of people of names in between. Um, I've just put a paper out recently towards a fair and objective consensus statement for brain injury in sport because the CISG downplay CTE. Yeah. They ignore all the research that shows CTE is a serious issue. Uh, they use concussion. They keep saying concussion is a transient injury until it's not. For some people, it never goes away. How can that be yeah. transient? And it's down, It's always downplaying, 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 always privileging sport. So at the heart of the BJSM, you've got people like Paul McCrory and you've got the uh, head of science for the IOC, for example, as part of the BJSM editorial team as well. And they're all appearing <laughs> to privilege sport, which really raises some questions there. Um, my first name on a paper was calling out uh, a rugby trial for lack of ethics. <laughs> so we wrote an editorial which I had a tiny little role in I was like the middle author in the, whoop, and the yeah. long line you know the big wigs at the out, uh, other end and the tiny little guy in the middle but it was enough for me to know exactly what was going on and their ethics were out their ethics were wrong um, and we called them out on it it's editorial so just before our editorial was published in the BJSM the BJSM allowed World Rugby authors to make over 100 changes to an already published article, including <laughs> changing the research question oh, wow. in an attempt to counter the points that we made. And it's all published, it's all public knowledge. Yeah, I've got a complaint in about that at the moment because I think it's corporate entanglement. There's a few emails that flew around. There's an email that I was copied in that, that I shouldn't that says, I'm completely right to make my complaint. So there's this huge fallout, you know, and, and it's like, what we've done so far by way of looking after brain injury, sport's looking to protect sport. Yeah. Unfortunately, McCrory's, McCrory being uh, um, dishonest uh, has unfortunately really hurt sport because yeah. litigation is now open. Sport's looking, it's clear to look to, to support sport. Yeah, it's not, not good, not good. So it's no surprise that the BJSM, with 3,500 articles, uh, uh, I think it's 350 articles published a year, uh, they get 3,500 submitted a year. So which mm. ones are they putting out there? Are they putting out there the ones, like from a couple of weeks ago, that show that um, um, neck strength actually, isometric neck strength actually is a benefit in concussion, or are they then stopping five or six that says it doesn't work? Yeah. So are we getting skewed data set through this? So I, I've, I've asked the question. I, I've got no skin in the game. I'm not looking for a career in academia. Uh, I'm no longer a professional athlete. Uh, I've got no business interests apart from a few bits of personal training in sport. Uh, I've got no skin in the game. What are they going to do to me? Yeah, exactly. If anyone so I'm listening, asking the questions. No, for, for anyone listening in the academic world, if you plagiarize in your publication, that's like career suicide. That's like the worst thing you can do. So <laughs> for anyone listening, that's just a, some perspective as well. Man, I had a whole bunch of questions. I forgot some of them, but I'm going to roll on to some more that I had anyway. Is there anything, anything that someone can do to help reduce the impact of TBI other than not get hit in the head? Supplements, <laughs> any, anything. Or is it just, okay, just stop getting hit in the damn head and that's all you, all you can do? So there's two, there's two things here. There's primary injury, mm -hmm. which is what happens when we get the initial trauma. There's absolutely nothing we can do to stop the primary trauma. Okay. Now, the brain cannot take the strain. So the only way of getting rid of the primary trauma, the primary injury is not to be hit in the first place. Yeah. Uh, if you get hit, you're screwed. 
Uh, <laughs> and then we've got the secondary injury, and that's what everyone's looking at. What can we do? How we can work? Yeah. So, for example, there's various things that will help. So a lot of the effects, um, so, for example, a lot of the testing that's highly sensitive and highly specific to traumatic brain injury looks at the effects on the eyes, the way that we can't track anymore, uh, smooth track and smooth pursuit, the way that we jump about. It all changes, even the focal you know, eyes going in different directions. <laughs> like, again, uh, it affects the eyes. Um, so they're looking at testing for that. So if the eyes are going funny, there's various ocular trainings that you can do, but that's not getting rid of the original injury. That's helping you redirect and reconnect. Yeah. yeah? Uh, physiotherapy, if you have balance and gait issues, for example, the musculoskeletal control on the body. Again, there's various physiotherapy approaches that show some degree of efficacy uh, in helping you recover from the movement disorders but again that's a rewiring that's not get not correction of the original damage uh, yeah. so we're kind of left with there's little things that we can do to kind of get rid of the signs and symptoms but it's not actually correcting the, injury. Uh, the underlying thing's still there you got it yeah. now pharmacologically <laughs> there's not a single pharmaceutical intervention so far that's shown to have any efficacy with human TBI. Mice is a different matter, <laughs> uh, but we're, we're not mice. Uh, for example, uh, let's pick on creatine, because I, I, I get gets really annoyed <laughs> because it's like, so creatine, for example, you've got the, the ISSN, they claim in a lot of their articles that creatine is neuroprotective, creatine mm, increases I've read that. and the rest of it. Yeah, until you actually look at it and you find out that it doesn't. They still don't even know whether the exogenous creatine, creatine that we eat, for example, actually passes the blood brain, blood, blood brain barrier <laughs> and gets to the brain in the first place, at least any more than normal homeostatic levels. Mm. <laughs> in rats, it does. In mice, it does. But unfortunately, it doesn't in humans. And let's just say that you've got to go some with creatine for it to have adverse effects on your body. You'll have like pre-existing yeah. kidney issues uh, or take it a long time, have hyperfiltration issues uh, for creatine to cause you some trouble. However, if it starts going up to the brain and you get too much up there, the brain gets rid of the waste. Mm -hmm. So the excess has a cost. So if it is passing the blood-brain barrier, you put the brain under strain to get rid of the waste, the excess that you don't actually need. <laughs> Not only that, if it does what they say it does, it'll be doing things like reducing <clears throat> inflammation. But inflammation is part of the reparatory process. Yeah. So you're actually stopping the brain adapting and, and, and healing if you're doing that. Also, it gives energy uh, to the brain, to those cells that are lacking energy. Hold on, that's part of the hibernatory state that we're going into to allow us to recover. So it, at least in the acute and subacute phase, creatine can actually be neurodegenerative rather than neuroprotective mm. if it does what yes. it says they do. Uh, but let's look at human studies. So with neurodegenerative diseases in rodents, there are a few studies that show a lot of promise. The studies with humans were stopped halfway through the trials because they had absolutely no effect. Um, it's a, a bit of a, yeah, so there's no human translation from the rodent yeah. studies. So when we look at TBI, there's only one piece of research that's looked at creatine with humans, Sakelis et al. And they've produced three papers, one of which has disappeared and I believe to be retracted. Hmm. What they looked at was uh, uh, about 30 kids with severe TBI hospitalized and the TBR was so bad that three of them during the course of the study died from their injuries. So it's got no cross reference to uh, uh, the, 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 the normal brain injuries from sports. We're talking catastrophic brain injuries here. And it did show that there was some result on these kids. Now, kids have got developing brains. Kids metabolism is slightly different to the more mature brains. So does it have translation over to humans? It was a pilot study as well. It could be by chance that uh, these couple of kids approved a few days earlier than others. So you've got this tiny pilot study in humans. 
and of course the uh, um, yeah those sponsored by supplement companies seem to say <laughs> yeah it works it works it doesn't it doesn't we haven't got the evidence there yet oh that that's it's good to know yeah. I need to go up, update a few of my articles now based on all the stuff you've told me. Sorry. But for, <laughs> that's good. That's good. For anyone as well who's thinking of creatine anyway, take your damn creatine for the performance benefits. <laughs> We're not saying not to take creatine. Um, that's right. Yeah. But I also wanted to touch on the idea. You get someone comment about this in the group and I'll, I'll rephrase it. Yeah. What, is, what is it then, for example, someone who maybe gets knocked out or whatever in the um, ring cage, whatever it is, some people seem to suffer more than others. So for example, someone might go through their fight career, not show any yeah. symptoms of the problem, but they could have underlying issues, whereas someone else mm -hmm. could maybe get knocked out once and then have lifelong issues after that. What is it yeah. that has that difference? Is it just genetic luck, how they got hit? <laughs> I'd, I'd, love to, I'd love to show you the chapter, but my laptop's sitting on the book. It's got about <laughs> 60, 70 pages, which says, and the chapter's called Why Outcomes Vary. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole series of issues. So firstly, suffering. Uh, I'm, I'm smiling because it just got cut from a thesis chapter. Uh, and I'm like, <laughs> damn, damn, I like it. I know where to put it now. But if we're doing uh, life stories, uh, ethnographies, and auto, I'm doing autoethnography in my experience with TBI, uh, I've never suffered from TBI. Mm -hmm. I've never suffered from it. However, I've probably had more TBI than anyone put together, <laughs> but I've never actually suffered from it. So suffering is a subjective experience. So for us, combat sport athletes, because we've got the mental toughness, we're resilient, we've got the pain thresholds, we just put up and shut up. For us, it's another day at the office. So firstly, combat sport athletes generally don't suffer. There's a, a brilliant um, autoethnography from a surfer um, and my God, does he suffer from his concussion? Um, football, hockey, the ethnographies there, they suffer from their traumatic brain injuries. And I'm reading it thinking, that was just Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> Combat sport. So firstly, you've got the culture, the whole psychology of it. It's a, a, a biopsychosocial, cultural, all in the mix um, for the how we actually experience something and the value, the valence, is it good or bad that we put on things? Like in combat sports, we seem to prize classic fights. Yeah, man, did you see that hit that I took? You proud of it? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, we, we prize it. But then we've got a whole lot of things. So it's got heterogeneity. It's got like everyone's an individual. Your head is a different shape to mine. You know, mine's kind of spherical and pointy in parts. You know, it's like Sputnik, as they, they said in that film. I, you know, <laughs> so, um, but I, I, I've got this resilience and I, I don't know where it comes from. It's got to be genetics and the way my body's put together. Um, I've had probably more hits than anyone. I'm doing a PhD. Shouldn't I be mush? But then it's like, it's compared to what? And what age will my neurodegeneration start to take place mm. compared to what it would have done without the hit impacts? Studies show it can be from anywhere from eight to 20 years early. Mm. Yeah, from a single concussion. Wow, okay, yeah, that's a long delay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Imagine what it's like for people like me. Uh, but then um, there are genetic risk factors as well that are being proposed uh, and that, that's emerging as well and it's likely i would suggest that i don't have the genetic markers that would predispose me for suffering uh, i probably genetically uh, got one heck of a lot of bits of spaghetti in my brain lots and lots and lots of connections uh, which means that the damage is having less overall effect the damage is still there but it's having less overall effect i've got enough bridges it yeah. could be could yeah um <laughs> It could just be chance. Yeah. You can't account for it. It's you know, interesting. I eh? might, yeah. I might spar next Monday, body boxing, and it might ping off my glove and get me. And that might be the one. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> the two, yeah. You know, it's, that it's one is like the final it, bit that goes. <laughs> it's interesting that some people were just, I guess, more susceptible from the beginning. Like, yeah. Some people might just have harder heads. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think it's too short planks. Yeah, yeah. I've got, in fact, I used to go. Uh, I used to have a regular MRI scan I had to get my fight licenses in Sweden and some of the American states. So I'd fly to Amsterdam and go to the Amsterdam MRI Center to get it, because for the cost of an MRI in the UK, 
I could fly out to, to Amsterdam, uh, have, have, have all my training out there, have the MRI, um, and basically have another two or three trips. It's just so expensive over here compared mm. to Amsterdam. So I fly over there. So I got to know the guys. So I landed in Stockholm for my fight, and I gave him my CD with a CD <laughs> with the uh, <laughs> uh, brain scans on it, showing my age now. Uh, CDs. They still give yeah. CDs for for brain for scans though. Well, they do here at least. <laughs> uh, what it should be? It should be like a, a drive. Should now yeah, exactly. Should just be a link now. You know? um, but they called me in for nothing to worry about. We found an anomaly that you might want to have a look at. And basically got the millimeter slices through my brain. They're calling up the images, calling up the images, calling up the images. And it calls up an x-ray of Homer Simpson's head with a peanut. <laughs> it's stuck in a scan of a, a cartoon of, amongst all of my sort of official... Crazy. But that's kind of what my brain's like. You know, you need, you need to have a brain to damage it, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're underselling yourself there. I have a couple more, I have a couple more questions as well. One of them, if you have kids, or actually no, let me let me let me start here. Grappling. Now, obviously, other than being thrown on your head, is being yeah. choked out, put to sleep. Is this going to be similar to a traumatic brain injury? Even though there's no yes, impact? it is. Yeah, really. The hypoxic state that it gives it <clears throat> creates. It's not the same, um, but it creates similar style effects. Um, so yeah, getting choked out. So if you're doing BJJ, tap mm. early. Yeah, uh, it's training. You're there to learn. Mm. Yeah, tapping out should be prized in training because you're being smart. Egos to the side. Mm. We're here to learn. So yeah, um, you know, I'm not like my judo days when my mate Rog and I it, it, it gets strangled. He managed to work it on, and then I'd tap, and that tells him, okay, I now relax. He gets it on good and proper, and I hold it off as long as I can. And sometimes you're floating around with out of body experience. You know, <laughs> um, that's crazy. That's doing my brain no good. Mm. Uh, so yeah, so in so judo. Um, getting repeatedly thrown onto the mat, that's the same as head in the football. So you need to limit the heavy impacts to the mat more. Uh, Uchi Komi throwing practice without actually the impacts on the yeah. ground. So uh, combat sports that strike, uh, they're the, uh, the, the highest uh, TBIs. Uh, wrestling and judo that throw and go to the ground. Uh, then they're lower, but they've still got their TBI level. BJJ, where, you know, sort of 0.0001% is takedowns, sorry, BJJ, and, <laughs> and the rest of it's on the ground. But because you can't <clears throat> on the ground more, the TBI risk is actually quite low. Yeah. It normally happens if you catch an elbow or a knee as you're passing guard. Um, but uh, or, or, you know, then practice that one time that you do the break, or do do a fall, <laughs> get thrown, you, oh, how do you break fall? This is news to me. <laughs> uh, but yeah, basically in, in BJJ, you don't get that many TBIs at all. It's actually very, very safe by way of the brain. Uh, small tissue injuries, perhaps a little bit different. Uh, but then, yeah, as long as you tap early and choke and, and, and mm. don't, don't hold off, the hypoxic state doesn't do you any favours. Are there, are there long-term effects then if, if that happens too often? Pretty similar to... Similar? Uh, Oh wow! Yeah, yeah. Okay, I didn't know that. All right, I'm tapping. There's not early. a lot of research. I'm tapping early well. today when I go to class. <laughs> Always tap early. It's like you know who who if someone's got a heel hook on, who holds it yeah. off? I'm tapping early. Thanks. Yeah. I, I, I like the rest of my life being able to walk. Thanks. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I want my, I want my knee intact. Mm. Yeah. So if you if you tap out early on a heel hook, um, just think you can live without your heel. <laughs> you can't live without your brain. Yeah. The tap early on the strangle as well. So again, it's like the one thing. I'm, I'm judo background. You know, a, a second down judo black belt, British, British uh, school judo team. Um, I was an international judo player. So for me, a choke is on the windpipe. <coughs> you choke, and a strangle is when you're on the crotted artery. You know, yeah, one cuts off the blood, one cuts off the air. You know, BJJ kind of get it, kind of like it's a strangle. That's a choke. Yeah, it's a choke. <laughs> No, it's a strangle. But yeah, so anything that cuts off the blood, tap early. Okay, that's good to know. <laughs> and I've, I've one last question for you regarding for people who maybe have kids, maybe they want to put their kids in combat sports and stuff like that. Is there, I guess, a safe way for them to do it? Maybe put them into grappling versus striking? Is it maybe trying to find a gym that, I guess, is more up to date with things and the way they train their kids? Is there something that parents can do maybe to, for their kids to be safer? Yeah. So first thing is that sport 
the sporting ideals, teamwork and all the, all, the, all the good stuff that sport gives you, confidence and all the rest of it. Sport doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> the research is quite clear. It doesn't. So physically, uh, physical activity, <clears throat> movement is what gives you the health benefit. If you do regular structured physical activity, exercise, because you can get repetition injuries, it actually is less good than unstructured normal physical activity. So physical activity, yeah, exercise, a little bit less so. Exercise played for fun, games, because a little bit of fun competition gets in there, the injuries stack up a little bit, so it's, that's less healthy still. Then sports, when you're playing to win, mm. generally mm. Uh, uh, it's a little bit less healthy. So even physically, it's physical activity that's key. So definitely prized physical activity. Now, sport, uh, just a quick one. Sport, for example, sport for all. It's the most exclusive sport, uh, exclusive activity ever. Yeah, if you're crap, you're on the bench. <laughs> you're exclusive. We're having the best guys, yeah? It's like, oh, come on, man. So it's not even inclusionary. Uh, so if you're getting psychological benefits from sport, it turns out not to be sport. It turns out to be damn good coaches. Mm. So I'm lucky that I've, you know, I've had masses of exceptional coaches that's taught me how to coach. And now I'm mentoring other people and how to coach, passing on what's been taught to me. Um, coaching is where it's at. So a coach who develops the, so if, if you get anything that's beneficial from sports, uh, it's coming from the coach, not the sport yeah, for itself, sure, for sure. it's the coach. <clears throat> so seek good coaches who are, it's all subjective, isn't it? Who's in alignment with your life morals and outcomes and such like, you know. Uh, the, the, you know, I, I would like, a, a, if someone, a Sunday morning football, for example, they're having a kick around soccer, they're having a kick around for the American Canadians around, you know, Canadians from Canadian land. Yeah, the Canadians, <laughs> uh, soccer. Uh, Sunday morning soccer, yeah. Someone makes a mistake and trips over and falls over the ball. The team goes spacky at them like, what are you doing? <laughs> you muppy, you idiot. I want to be with the coaches who encourage the teammates, come on, you muppet, up you come, let's put this right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The ones who help and encourage and engender teamwork, who, who, who lift people up, give benefits, who recognize that, you know, you're really crap at that, but you're my crap at that. Come on, let's go. The one that get inclusion, does that make sense? Yep. No, that makes oh, a lot of sense. Smile, takes the pressure off, lets them know that. You know, deliberate practice is what gets results. But hey, let's have a smile mm -hmm. and laugh while we do it. Yeah. The ones who don't bully, the ones who actually meet their duty of care. Mm -hmm. So, and it's got to be a, 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 a subjective and objective call for that individual. The parents do need to wise up. If, uh, if a combat sports mm -hmm. club is allowing hits to the head. Yeah, that's a big no-no, red flag. That would be a red flag because... They may not see the harm in doing it, but if they're not seeing the harm in doing it, what else are they not seeing the harm in doing? Mm. What, what kind of, uh, where, yeah. I was going to say, what kind of, because obviously the kids, they're the developing brain, uh, taking hits yeah. to the head, is it a different effect than um, an adult? Uh, like oh, yeah, yeah. A, a far worse effect then, is it? Yeah, yeah. So we get um, <clears throat> rapid periods of development every few years in the brain. It's like when, before lockdown, uh, uh, there's some kids that I taught um, and they're about so high after lockdown. They're yeah. that high, looking down, what, what, what are you growing? It's, a, it's like a, I caught up with one, uh, um, Mike and Courtney came last night and Courtney was a kid. It was really funny because she had one hell of a chopping leg kick and she really used to take it out of her dad. <laughs> she wasn't allowed out one night, she'd chop it out. And she's come back as a woman. <laughs> you know what I mean, the, the, but the brain's like that. It develops really, really quick and has these rapid periods of development. If you get hit at that point in time, some areas of the brain may not actually come online. Mm. So it's quite serious <clears throat> in the developing brain. The impacts can be literally impacts can literally be quite uh, with the pun there um, can literally be really significant. And the brain continues to mature until the age around 24, 25 although most of it is under the ages of, of sort of 18, 19. So under the age of 18, 19, if you're taking hits to the head, you might be throwing the entire developmental pathway of your brain off on some different tangent. Mm. 
it's mm. quite it's quite worrying. Um, I've got a bit on um, um, a, a bit a book on <laughs> um, development the, the the developmental brain and acquired brain injury. So you can have like biological, uh, you can have hypo- hypoxic lack of uh, oxygen, uh, you can have viral insults. I love it, insults of the brain, you have traumatic <laughs> boom, insults of the brain. So, uh, you know, looking at that book, it's, reading that book scared me. Yeah. It really right. scared me. So even if the kid doesn't display any overt signs of behavioral effects from it, you're still lowering and reducing where they could have been which yeah. is the worrying thing so yeah kids it's a, it's a tricky one and i love my combat sport I <laughs> say that i got so scared after just the you know bearing around three three years in now so back in just just around 2016 when uh, uh i first did this uh online thing about let's go encounter eric anderson with uh, uh getting hit in the head as child abuse you know mm-hmm. <laughs> The moment I realised that, it took me a few weeks for it all to sink in. I'm like, I've got to, I've got to, I've got to. And I stopped all head contact in my training for those under 16. Mm. A few weeks later, under 18. A couple mm-hmm. of months after that, no head contact in my classes. Nice. My class numbers actually went up and I had no loss in ability. In fact, in some areas, I had an increase in ability as well. So That's very you know, interesting. It's doable. People just need to... People just need to... Yeah, it's, it's a, I mean, all sports have it, right? They all have the old, some kind of old school or traditional mentality through it. I mean, yeah. you mentioned rugby a lot. I mean, rugby is where I worked most of my career and there's there's still a lot of stuff that goes on in rugby. That's just, you know, you sit there going, what the fuck? Why? <laughs> you know, and obviously all, all sports have it. All sports have it. And some are yeah. becoming slowly more, I guess, advanced or advancing through as yeah. as more people come in and new ideas come in. But I mean, that's, that's the whole idea of this podcast as well. You know, I'm pulling in people from not just combat sports. I'm going to pull people in from other sports, other areas of yeah. research and things like that that can offer insight into how they do things that can be applied, you know, because it's not just not just within combat sports. <laughs> yeah. So in, in combat sports, though, uh, Yuki, Yuki Price, who I, I passed my class to, I, I didn't go out to teaching after uh, lockdown. I'll go back and enjoy it myself now. So I passed it to, to a really skilled coach. He's, he's done a sports, uh, sports coach and sports science degree. Uh, and he had the same sort of mentality as me of learn development and put the, put the clients first. And it's perfect because he's kept the same atmosphere, the same feeling in the class. And now I can just go and have some fun. Uh, like no. getting swept by one of the youngsters last week, which is so funny. <laughs> so funny. Have a look on YouTube. It's gone, it's gone viral on Instagram at the moment as well. It's like had like 30,000 people have seen me swept there by a kid. It's like, ah, oh. it's that's really fun. But he is dancing as well. And he's been telling me some of the things that he's been getting from dance, like mm. foot placement and such like. Uh, you know, we combat sports can really wake up to different people. Uh, there's, a, there's a ballerina. And celebrity in the UK called Darcy Bustle. Um, and I was lucky enough to, to get to chat with her on a social level. Um, and we were talking about the, uh, the, the similarities between dance and kickboxing. Mm-hmm. The focus is different. One is to look good and in time with the music, so to speak, and others, others for it to be applied. But there's a real big crossover between the two. Yeah, that's the rhythm, yeah, right? You got it. That's well, it. <clears throat> On the rhythm, interestingly on that, um, I would never fight to the rhythm. Mm. The Dutch flow is based on melody mm. rather than the rhythm. If you go bom, 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 now you're readable. Yeah, it's predictable there, yeah. Yeah, so they do half beat shots, quarter beat yeah. shots, pause yeah. beats, slur beats and such like, and get like a, a melody going on there. Mm. That's nice because it's a way of- it's a way to break that rhythm down, right? You know, you're playing with the rhythm yeah. there again. So it's yeah. it's that concept throughout. It's, it's, it's really interesting. It's, I think most people- So we can learn from music. That. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But most people miss that in all sports, you know? It's it's about being able to play with rhythm. And it comes down to at, not just sitting there doing strength conditioning on its own, and then I'm just going to do skills on the pads and whatever else. You need to have that stimulus back so you can play with the rhythms and break them. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's a, a different tangent, but. <laughs> yeah, well, on, on a tangent, to offer you something for rugby, one of the things that combat sports can teach rugby is ground force reaction. Because it's, it's the, the push into the ground that drives, that's the initial drive yeah. through for the punches. That's what, that's what creates the power and acceleration and everything. 
so the ground force reaction and that depends on the foot placement so I went to work with a semi-professional a semi -professional rugby team and one of the players was like the flash it was like so fast it was unreal and I said to him you realize you can be quicker he says what do you mean I said on that turn you took five paces five steps if you make these little adjustments you could do it in three you can be sharper and faster on your turns more efficient less energy quicker overall hey how'd you do that and i started to show him about how to place the feet mm. and he became quicker as a result so for example from combat sports we can offer the rugby foot placement <laughs> <laughs> and grappling i use a lot of jujitsu stuff wrestling yeah oh do you do breathing no not much i mean it depends how much time you've got you know <laughs> so here's the thought you ever wondered why athletics tracks you run counterclockwise whereas everything else goes clockwise no i have not <laughs> breathe out on your dominant side so if i'm right sided that's my right side yeah <laughs> as i push on the right mm. side so it, it's, it's leftist yeah it gotcha. disadvantages the left is going around but you can power around the turn because you're pushing more with the right leg and you breathe out the right leg yeah so i would know someone's going to hit me three shots beforehand by watching their breathing just the breathing uh, muscles yeah so with rugby for example just on their breaths if you want to tackle someone and win them you want them breathing out mm. if you initiate the tackle and they're breathing in so breathing out they have to breathe in again to react to the tackle yeah. So if you time it, so just after they've driven off on their dominant side, for example, they're a right handed player off their right leg, and then you tackle, they're not going to be able to react. You're also going to be slow to get up off the ground. <laughs> uh, <laughs> There's lots of crossovers. <laughs> yeah, interesting. Well, we've taken up a good 90 minutes of your time here, Gary, but thank you for coming on. This has been, yeah, a learning experience for me too. And I'm sure everyone else listening has learned a, a shit ton as well. But where can anyone, I guess, keep up with your work or, or find you somewhere to, to get in touch? Yeah, you can find me on Facebook. Uh, you can find me on Twitter, Smiler Turner. Um, oh, I'll find you on Twitter you, too. Yeah, I'm, I'm on, I can't remember <laughs> what I'm uh, called on Instagram. That's terrible. Uh, I'm not great. I've got no skin in the game. I'm just me. Um, you know, I'm, not, I'm not looking to build an Insta following and stuff. You know, I'll be wearing bikinis and push my cleavage up. But that's <laughs> Uh, but yeah, so I'm on Instagram, I'm on Twitter, I'm on Facebook, uh, I'm on um, uh, obviously the performance page, uh, yep. conditioning page. Come on, come and find me, give me a little hunt. Um, and yeah, any questions, fire it out. And the thing I always say on these things is come at this podcast and what I say as from the cognitive bias position that everything I've said tonight is completely and utterly wrong <laughs> and look to prove me wrong. Mm hmm. Because it might be that somewhere I am actually wrong, in which case I'll get it more right in the future. <laughs> exactly. No, thank you for coming on. I really appreciate it. We might have to do a round two at some point and talk more concussion stuff as, as more of your research comes out too. So Just shout us up. Just shout yeah, us we'll up. Definitely keep on that. Perfect. Thank you, Gary. Appreciate it.